as we're talking about today, we're talking about temptation. Uh, anybody tempted Thursday to maybe eat too much? Maybe Thursday, Saturday, Sunday is like wherever you go, there's like way too much food there and you had to tell yourself not to, not to eat as much. <clears throat> You know, the, there's, there's all kinds of miracles in this text that we're talking about today. And that the miracle of Jesus defeating Satan through his temptations means so much for you and I. Because we all have our temptations. We all have our issues that we have to deal with. Your issues are not the same as my issues. My issues are, of course, different. You know, but we can all look at our issues of our temptations... The things that we have to struggle with and the things that we have to stand up for. And we all have them. Oh, some of us can hide them better than others. But in those temptations, we have to understand how did Satan defeat, how did Jesus defeat Satan through those temptations? And how can we stand up against those temptations? You can look at your own mind's eye and you can say, you know, I struggle in this area. Or I struggle in that area. We have to remember our definition of a miracle is the interruption of laws of nature. The interruption of laws of nature. If it is natural for us to do something and we have to stand up against it, sometimes we have to stand and understand Satan is going to come into our lives, but there's things that we must do in order to defeat the power of Satan and those temptations that are carnal. Let me give you a few ideas. The first... We often face great challenges immediately after great blessings. Sometimes everything is wonderful and great and everything's on the top of the world and everything is wonderful and you've defeated four or five or six different things and the kids are doing good and everything's wonderful and all of a sudden a decision is made, a temptation is given and we fall flat on our face and we say, how far can I go? I was on the top of the mountain yesterday and I'm in the valley today because of a temptation. Because of a decision. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus, through a temptation, he was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. And when he was being baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him and, and the voice of God departed out of heaven. said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. Jesus was baptized and John the Baptist even said, I must decrease so he can increase. In the very next story, Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. The, the utopia of Jesus lived 33 years and at starting of his ministry, he was proclaimed as the Messiah. But then the wilderness experience was unbelievable. Dr. Adrian Rogers called it the principle of the devil and the dove. He would say, whenever God opens the window of heaven to bless you, the devil will be open the doors of hell to blast you. If you're going to get blessed by God, you need to be prepared to be blasted by Satan. And sometimes that we don't like the blast. Sometimes we love the blessing. Sometimes we ask God to bless us and then we're not prepared. We take our eyes off of God and we put our eyes on what we have. And that's when Satan absolutely destroys us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 11 and 12. These things, that's the Old Testament, were written down as warnings for us. So if you think you stand firm, be careful that you don't fall. Be careful. If you think you got everything figured out. If you think, I will never fall to that temptation. If you think I will never give in to that, if you think that would never be me, I've got this thing figured out. i got my Christianity all lined up. I understand exactly what I fall for, and I've got that firmed up. Be careful when you think you stand, because when you think you stand is exactly when you will fall. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. So it's not amazing to see people hurt. It's not, I, I, I'm not caught off guard when people tell me certain things within their life. Because temptation and sin is real. And what we have to understand is Satan wants to destroy us. He wants to deceive you. And we have to understand that Satan is the father of lies. And whatever Satan tells you, it is a lie. There may be a bit of truth in everything that is said. 
but the end result is lies. So we have to understand when we get to the mountaintop, expect the, the blast from Satan. But we also have to understand we can recognize Satan's temptations and strategies. We can understand and recognize Satan's temptations and strategies. In 2 Corinthians 2.11... That's exactly what Paul wrote as we observe. In order that Satan might outwit us, for we are not aware of his schemes. We have to be aware of what is he going to do. And he did three things to Jesus. And I want to tie what he did to Jesus in something that we can apply to how he may tempt us today. The first thing he said is, let's turn those stones into bread. In other words, do something selfish to meet your physical needs. Do something selfish. To meet your physical needs. Don't rely on God. Do something for yourself. Do something that you would like. Do something that what you want. And not necessarily what God wants. Satan always tries to appeal to our base need, nature first. Our physical needs. There's no doubt Jesus was extremely hungry for fasting for 40 days. He was weak and tired in the flesh. But he had power in the spirit. And sometimes when we are weak in the flesh... That's where we have to stand up and say, I am praying. I am asking God to do something great in my life. I may be weak in the flesh, but I can still have power in the spirit. And I will not fail when I am weak in the flesh. But so often, when we become weak in the flesh, and we start falling into temptations, that's when we stay away from God the most. When we need God, we say, ah, I'm embarrassed to talk to God. When we have failed God, we say, you know, God doesn't necessarily like me right now. When I have made a mistake, in order for God to forgive us, I have to humble myself. I don't run from God. I need to come to God. Jesus resisted Satan by saying, Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that cometh out of the mouth of God. So when Satan is tempting you, when your temptation that you're dealing with and you are alone, and it's you and that temptation. How do you deal with that temptation? The character that you need to have is standing up and say, I don't need that. I need God. So sometimes we have to understand that we can't satisfy our flesh sometimes. We have to understand that we need to honor God. And then Satan said this, jump down. Just cast yourself down. In other words, Jesus said, do something sensational to get people to accept you. Satan was saying, if you would just cast yourself down, you don't, you, do you realize angels of heaven would come down and rescue you before you would hit the ground? And everybody would know that you were the Messiah. Everybody would know that you were the Son of God. And Jesus says, I am not here for sensationalism. I'm here for the salvation of the cross. And if Satan could have gotten him to jump off of that temple and to cast himself down. Surely God would have rescued him. Surely he would have. But it would have not have been the redemptive plan that God has in store for us. Jesus said this, you shall not put the Lord your God to a test. Don't tempt God. You don't test God. The second temptation is do something sensational. Sometimes what Satan tempts us is... You need more people to like you. In our society today is this. How many friends do you have on Facebook? How many likes do you have? How many followers do you have on, twi on Twitter? How many, how many people are following you? How many people like what you're saying? Are you getting likes? Or are you getting dislikes? And if somebody doesn't like you, do we get our self-identity hurt? And it's something just sensational. It's not about having people accept you. It's how many people can we honor in doing what God wants us to do. True faith never requires sensational signs to believe. On the surface, it may appear that jumping off the high wall would cause people to see who Jesus truly was. But Jesus understood that the jumping the sensationalism off that high wall in that temple was never going to defeat Satan. The only way that he was going to defeat Satan was God's plan. And sometimes we think that I can do something that people will like me or I can do things and people will follow me. And Jesus is saying, that's not what I have planned for you. Don't jump off into sensationalism. Stand where God wants us to go. And then Satan said this, bow down. Bow down. And I, I think this bow down to Satan in our society today is almost like bow down to greed. 
bow down, do something sinful, to even get rich. Satan's third temptation is to bow down to greed. Satan was suggesting, do something sinful and do it quick. Bow down to me. He transported Jesus to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, this I will give to you if you bow down. And I have to remember, and you have to remember, Satan is a liar. God created the heavens and the earth. Satan was temporarily put on this earth. But the world, this earth, is God's. We are inhabitants, but we are not owners of this world. This is God's world, and God has final authority. When Jesus transported, when Satan transported Jesus to this mountaintop, and he said, all this world would be given to you. In our society, you're talking, how much money? What would I be able to get? The power that I could have? I, 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 could, I could do all this, and all of a sudden our mind starts thinking. And let's put it this way. The, the Powerball is up to $545 million. That's not, I'm just my hypothetical. $545 million, and you have a 1 in 10% chance of winning that Powerball. How many of us would jump all over that? We would jump all over that. How, how much money I got in the checking account? Because I'm going to put it as many times as I can. Because we're going to pay the church off. We're going to do all these things for Jesus. And we would do whatever we could do. But you know what that boils down to? Things. What can I get? Here's what Jesus said. Get out of here. It is written, you shall worship one Lord, your God, and serve him only. You can't serve God and money. You can't have everything. What we must do is we have to understand, we have to bow down and honor God. And Satan was just trying to get Jesus to think of himself. He was trying to get Jesus to get rid of the redemptive plan. He was trying to get Jesus just to do something that God didn't want him to do. And here's what, we must be alert. Because Jesus is very persistent. He's very persistent. You may win today. But that fight is not over with tomorrow. You may win this battle, but Satan is very persistent in the battles that he wants to fight with you. The struggles, the issues, and the battles that you struggle with is on a daily basis. And you may win today, and you may lose tomorrow. And here's what he says. Every one of us must die to ourself today. What does that mean? That means, that means I have to understand, I may win today because I'm putting my focus on God, but I may lose tomorrow if I put my focus back on me. And if I do not have victories under my belt, it is going to be very difficult to have victories over the long haul. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4, 13, Satan left for a more opportune time. In other words, he tempted for 40 days. And Jesus never faltered. He stood up and proclaimed the word of God in Satan's face. And Satan got frustrated because Jesus could not fail. And he said, I am going to leave you for a more opportune time. He is persistent. He is not going to leave you forever. He is going to tempt you forever. Do you remember how Satan confronted Jesus just a few years later? It was in the upper room. And Judas has been manipulating Jesus. And the Bible says that that time, Satan entered into Judas. And he betrayed him. Entered into him. Pure evil. Pure evil. That wasn't just the crucifixion of Jesus. What Satan was trying to do was trying to stop Jesus. Stop the redemptive plan. Satan entered in. And it had a more opportune time. He thought Jesus was vulnerable. And he wanted to destroy him. Peter warns us in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. Be self-controlled. And alert. Your enemy the devil. Prowls around like a roaring lion. Seeking for someone to devour. That totally means to destroy. To, 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 to tear apart your life. 
And you have to understand the temptations and the sins that you deal with, the same as Jesus had dealt with, the roaring lion, the devil, he wants to devour you. He wants to trap you. He wants to lay a snare for you. What that snare is, is if, if anybody like to hunt around here? Where's David at? I know David's a big hunter. A snare is very simple. You put a, a trap. My dad used to coon hunt, and he would lay a snare out by the, by the river's edge, and he would just lay it open. And then the next morning, we'd come by and see if, if there's any um, raccoons that were in the trap. Jesus is saying, that's exactly what Satan is doing for us. He knows where we have fallen in the past. He sees what our temptations have caused us in the past. He doesn't know our future because he is not omniscient. But what he does know, he knows where we've gone in the past. So what he has done, he looks at our past and he sees the things that we have done in the past. And because he knows what we have done in the past, he lays traps for us in the present because of what we've done in the past. So he knows that if we struggle here, or we have struggled here, what he does, he lays a snare for us here. Thinking that if they do the same thing they have done yesterday, they do that same thing today, I'm going to lay a, sna a snare for him. So just by some chance, if he does, look at that. If he does, go there. If he does, go do what he has done in the past, he is going to be trapped. So we all do what we've done in the past, and we go where we went in the past, and all of a sudden we are caught in the snare or the trap of Satan. And we're stuck. Our leg, our hand, our foot, our eyes are stuck in the snare of Satan, and we can't get away. We feel like we have no hope, and we are stuck. And we don't know what to do, so we tried to hide the fact that we are caught in a snare. And Satan is saying, I have you. I have you. And you're trying everything to get rid of that temptation or that snare. And nothing works. You are caught in the snare, the trap of the devil. And the devil is trying to demolish you. And you're sitting there and you have no hope. You don't know what to do. But as a child of God, what Jesus did for you at that moment is he says, I have come to release the chains of bondage upon your life. The snare that you are in, the bondage that you are in, Jesus comes into your life as he does with salvation and he opens up the snare of the devil, releases you from him and gives you a second chance. And he says, go, sin no more. Don't do it. I am not condemning you. I am loving you. I am not condemning you. I am forgiving you. Just don't get caught in the trap. And for a few weeks, oh, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. He rescued me. Thank you. I'm going to give out my whole heart to God. I'm going to, I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm, I'm going to be a deacon of the church. I'm going to do everything I need to do because Satan is defeated and I'm safe. So everything goes on for a couple weeks. And guess what? We start going back to the snares, the temptations, the failings. Everything's good for a while. I'm not caught. It's all good. I go back. Because that's what I'm used to. But what Jesus really wants us to do is understand the punishment and the sin that's back there and what the cause is. And not get caught in the trap of the snare of the devil. But understand the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus. And we have to have something with us that's so much more important to us than the sin and the temptation. But let's look at three things that I want to be done. It's not a sin to be tempted. Temptation is not a sin. Somebody say amen to that. Temptation is not a sin. We all are tempted. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verses uh, 14 through 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yes, without sin. Temptation is not a sin. It's what we do with that temptation that causes us to sin. We can either say no to that temptation or we can embrace that temptation. But the temptation itself is not sin. For every temptation you face, Jesus faced. He is the sinless lamb of God. Billy Graham used to compare temptation to sin by saying, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. 
That's what Billy Graham said. I think that's so good. You know, we can't help some things from just taking place. Things are going to take place, and you're, whoa, okay, time out. I wasn't prepared for that. But to do something over and over and over, again, temptation itself is not a sin. But listen to this one. No temptation is irresistible. We can resist every temptation. We can. I've had people tell me that they've had a bad ex example, they've had a bad life, and the temptation was just too much for them, and they could not resist it. That's not true, because God's Word says, no temptation has seized you except which is common to man. In other words, your temptation that you face is not a temptation that you alone have to face. There are other people that will face that temptation and they will help you. That means your temptation is not unique to you. Others have faced it and have resisted it. Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out that you may stand up under it. He will give you a way out. As a child of God, as a child of God that are, that's bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, when that temptation is coming your way, you have to realize that temptation is coming and see what it is. We understand Satan's schemes. We understand what he does. We understand where we have been. And when we are tempted, the Bible says he is going to give you a way out, a back door. But so often... What we do when we are tempted, because we are not tempted into things we do not like. Right? You're not tempted. I'm not tempted to eat broccoli. Oh, I'm not tempted to eat broccoli. Now, you put a banana cream pie in front of me. Oh, that back door better be big. But if somebody put something in front of me that I am not tempted at, I have no problem walking right by that. But you put something that I truly desire, I don't turn and look at the back door. I turn and look at what I desire. And that's what dog handlers do. A master dog handler is teaching a dog. He would say this. He trains that dog. And he says, sit. Sit. The dog sits. He puts a morsel of dog food, whatever that dog truly wants. He puts it right in front of him. Tells him to sit. The dog intently looks at his master. Stands across the room. And he says, come. The dog will rock right by the food. And come straight to the master. And the dog's eyes will always be on the master's eyes. It will not look down at the food. If the dog stops and looks at the food, master stops him. Sit. And the dog looks straight at him. He says, come. The dog comes to him. And that's exactly what we must... <laughs> I don't want to relate to us as dogs. But he is the master. And if we keep our eyes firmly on the master, the temptations of this world will grow strangely dim. But if we keep our eyes on what we desire and we don't look at the master, we're going to stop for the food. And the food? Oh, okay. It was good for a season. It was good while it happened. But then I have to look up my master. And if your dog's anything like my dog, when he does something wrong, that sheepish look, I did something wrong. I know we've been gone for four hours. I know you did something wrong. But that dog always looks at the master with that sheepish look in his eyes, knowing he did something wrong. And I truly believe we could relate that to us. That sometimes when we go through a temptation, if we keep our eyes on Jesus instead of on the temptation, if we put our eyes what Jesus wants us to do and not on the temptation, I can go past the temptation because he is going to make a way out of every temptation because we are his child and he loves us unconditionally. The Bible says to flee every evil desire from the youth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Uh, my favorite preacher, his name is Andy Stanley. And, um, I, I try to read and listen to everything Andy Stanley says. But in one of his marriage counseling, he says, drop the rope. Drop the rope. 
your temptations have you hung around the neck. And the temptation is doing everything you want it to do. And that temptation is a rope that's tied around your neck so tight, so tight that whatever that temptation is, it drags you around and everything in your life is controlled by your temptation or your sin or your addictions. And it's tied around your neck. And that temptation, that sin, or that desire is controlling everything that you do privately. Oh, you may, you may be able to fake it for a while out in front. But if that addiction, sin, or temptation is real within your life, it is a loose noose around your neck being controlled by the very thing that you want. The temptation. The desire. So if it is controlling you, and you actually want what it is, you're okay. Until we get to the point that we don't want to be controlled by a temptation, a sin, or an addiction, that rope is going to tie around our neck. But there has to be a day when you say, I do not want to be controlled by sin. I do not want to be controlled by temptation. I do not want to be controlled by my addictions. Then we can take that rope around our neck and throw it off and say, Jesus, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I know that that sin, I know that that addiction, I know that my problems are mine. And I have to own me. The only way that I'm going to own me is if I give me to you. And I know that you can break those addictions. I know that you can stop. I know if I just give them to you. Drop the rope and don't negotiate with Satan. If you negotiate with Satan, you will lose. If you negotiate with God, you will win. Who do you want on your side? The last point. Waiting on God's provision is always better than settling for the devil's substitute. Waiting on God's provision is better than settling for Satan's substitute. In Matthew 4, 11, we just said that. The devil left. And in his place, the angels came to minister to him. He had fasted for 40 days. He was hungry. Spiritually, he was exhausted. He was fighting the forces of hell for 40 days. And he did not sin. He did not eat physical food for 40 days. So the angels came and minister to him. Anybody know what food they gave him? Angel food cake. <laughs> that's, my, that's my favorite cake in the world, by the way. <laughs> Thomas Brooke wrote this. Satan promises the best, but pays with the worst. He promises honor, and he pays with disgrace. He promises pleasure, and pays with pain. He promises profit, and pays with loss. He promises life. And he pays with death. When you trade in what God wants for you, we lose. We lose. Sometimes we accept the temporary pleasure of this world. And we lose the peace that God wants to give us that we can't even comprehend. Why? It's because the temptation, the simple temptation that is not sin, becomes so real to us that we desire the temptation more than we desire the blessing of God. Temptation. You could all make a list right now. And I'm sure in that list, you would have a few of those temptations. That you fail, the sin that you have committed, the life that you do in the flesh, and you're saying, man, I, I wish I could give that one over. I wish I could have a do-over on that one. I wish I would never look at that or I wish I would never do that. And those temptations are temptations from Satan. And what he's trying to do, he's, he's trying to put a snare within your life and he wants to say this to you. You will never defeat your sin. You can't do it. You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not spiritual enough. You will never defeat me. 
And in our minds, we have been in that sin for so long. We have been tempted in that sin since our teenage years. We have been caught in that addiction for years. And we believe the lie of Satan. I'll never get out of it. I've gone too far. I've said too much. I hate too much. And Satan is saying, just stay there. Just get used to it. That's your new normal. Just be happy with what you... Nobody needs to know that you're, you're miserable. Nobody needs to know that. Just stay where you are and be happy. And Jesus says, no more. I have come to break every addiction, every chain of bondage. I have came to satisfy my spiritual life within your body and forgive you of every sin that you've ever committed. And I want to give you hope and peace and forgiveness of every sin. Period. There's nothing that I cannot forgive, nothing I would not forgive, but what you have to do is you have to get rid of the bondage. You have to get rid of the shackle. You have to get rid of the snare. I cannot forgive you unless you are broken enough to get up and take off the snare off your leg, the bondage around your hands. I love you. I have bought you with the blood of Jesus Christ. You are mine. You're not Satan's. He wants to keep you. He wants to snare you. He wants to lie to you. He wants you to think it isn't getting any better than this. But I promise you, my ways are much greater than your ways. My thoughts are greater than your thoughts. My plans for you are so much better than what you could ever have for yourself. Get rid of the sin. Stop the temptations. Know what Satan is trying to do within your life because he knows what you have done yesterday. He is going to lay a snare for you tomorrow. If we don't make a change today, that snare is going to be there tomorrow. It's very simple. It's exactly what the Bible says would take place. There's a song that I've asked Justin to play for invitation. There's a song that you know very well. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If we don't focus on Jesus, we'll never get our eyes off of ourselves. And we are just like that dog that's being trained. Focus on what Jesus wants for your life. When we look at the snares of Satan, when we like those temptations, sometimes we just settle for what we've always had. And Jesus says, don't settle. Don't settle. Focus. Let me forgive. But here's what we have to do. We have to be honest. We have to be honest with ourselves. It makes no difference what anybody else thinks. Everybody's going through their own stuff. Everybody has their own temptations. Everybody has their own limitations. But Jesus is saying, put your eyes on me. Look full into my grace. Because what I want to do for you is the struggles that you have, the issues that you're going through, I need you to send them my way. Set up and take, take that snare off your ankle. Take that bondage away and give them to me and let me take care of you.